But this morning I want to challenge us with a little bit of a heart. Well, it was not a little bit, if it's a big heart issue that I believe is one of one of the main root causes of disunity in the church, in your relationships, in your workplaces, in your families. So we're going to focus on that. This heart issue is what put us in trouble really in the beginning. This heart issue is really what separated us from walking with God back in the early days of creation. So we're going to turn to Genesis 2. And it's verse 2, chapter 2, sorry, chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. And we read, God commanded the man, you can eat from any tree in the garden except from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from it. The moment you eat from that tree, you're dead. And in the rest of that chapter, chapter two, we get introduced um, to Eve being created. And then we're going to jump to verse three, chapter three, sorry, verses one to six. And this is what it says. So you can read along with me. The serpent was clever, more clever than any wild animal God had made. He spoke to the woman, do I understand that God told you not to eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, no, not at all. We can eat from from the trees in the garden. It's only about that tree in the middle of the garden that God said, don't eat from it. Don't even touch it or you'll die. The serpent told the woman, you won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from that tree, you're really going to see what's going on. You'll be just, you'll be just like God, knowing everything, ranging all the way from good to evil. And when the woman saw that the tree looked good, eating, she realized what she would get out of it. She, she'd know everything. She took and ate the fruit and then gave some to her husband and he ate. It is a good verse, Leah. In this passage, we see quite a few problems, right? We see disobedience, we see deceit, we see temptation, and well, What I see to be the real hard issue of why Eve fell into the serpent's trap is when you look at verse six. She saw the tree, it looked good, and she knew she'd get something out of it. Knowledge. Eve wanted what God had, and she didn't. Knowledge. She was thinking of herself. She was coveting what God had, and she didn't possess. Eve fell into the trap of temptation because basically her heart wanted something that someone else had. Even though she had been warned of the consequences, death, and even though she had been given the freedom of everything else in that garden. And when you really think about that, what a beautiful, stunning place the Garden of Eden must have been. She had the freedom And not only the freedom, but she had the responsibility along with Adam to rule that, to look after, to tend, to take responsibility for. But it still wasn't enough. Eve wasn't satisfied. She wanted more and she wanted something that someone else had. She coveted the knowledge that God had. Now, before we all go and give Eve a hard time, because I know we all like to do that, right? We all like, oh, Eve, if you hadn't sinned, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in. But before we go and get all cross and cranky at poor Eve, let's just take a wee bit of a step and have a little look at ourselves first. As sorry as I am to say this, this heart issue that Eve had, unfortunately, has not changed in our human nature. Actually, probably over the generations, it's probably got worse. And if ever we live in a generation where it is at an all-time high, it is probably now. We didn't learn from Eve We just continued on wanting what was not ours. So I know the word covet isn't one that we really use today, right? You don't hear someone going, oh, look at her coveting there. You don't hear it. It's not a word that we use in our language. But as you will know, as intelligent people that you are, it is basically wanting what is not yours. That's what it is to covet. To covet is to want something that belongs to someone else and that does not belong to you. And when you say it like that, it doesn't really sound that bad, does it? 
it doesn't really sound that, that terrible or that harmful to anyone. Wanting what someone else has, it's no big deal. Me wanting something doesn't really affect you. It doesn't really affect anything. But you see, that's, I think, where we're really being tricked into this trap. Because firstly, what we have done, we have changed the language that we use around it. We've changed the language from coveting to a more user-friendly version of desire. And everybody thinks desire is a great word, right? Oh, I desire to have that, uh, you know, second slice of pizza. Yes. Um, desire sounds like a good thing. It doesn't sound offensive. Or would say, oh, I'd really like, I really want, I really like. We've used and turned to a more user-friendly language. We've changed the language. Now, wait for it. We've changed the language over the generations because we don't want the offender selves, right? We've changed it so that it doesn't offend ourselves and that it doesn't offend the people around us. So, and here's the big one. We do that so that we don't offend ourselves and that's so that we can justify getting what we want. Good? Because here we are in a generation and we see throughout the, the, the word of, um, in the Bible, we see this. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. Me, myself, and I. That's the culture that we live in. And really, when we look back to the time of the Garden of Eden, we see that it was exactly the same. You see, the change of language makes it appear less of a problem. It makes it less of something that we need to change. It becomes less of a sin when you say, oh, I desire something or I would like something. But coveting is an invisible pandemic that is destroying us as a generation from the inside out. We don't always see it in ourselves. There's danger number one. We don't see it in our hearts because we've watered it down. We don't necessarily see it as sin anymore. The changing of our language is we've actually watered it down so much that it distracts us from the fact that it's actually a command from God. And if we look at Exodus 20 verse 17, and this is in the Amplified version, which my lovely teammate went and typed out for me um, in the Amplified version, so thank you, Nicola, for that. And it says, you shall not covet, that is, selfishly desire and attempt to acquire your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You see, you shall not covet belongs in the Ten Commandments. The laws, rules, whatever, you, how you want to exp describe them, given to us to live by. A guy called Jay John, if you haven't checked him out, absolutely amazing, super guy. He said this little statement, and I think it's so true. The commandments were not given to be debated. They were given to be lived. And yet over the years, we have continued our lives, living them in a way that takes us further and further and further away from the Ten Commandments, the rules, instructions, guidelines, laws, whatever you want to say, that God has given us to live by. You see, we've deceived ourselves again that the commandments are rules or laws that are restricting or take away your freedom so that we don't follow them anymore or we water them down like, oh, you know, I'm not covered in that. I would just like it. We water them down because why? Because it suits us. It justifies how we want to live our lives, how we decide we want to do something. It meets our needs and to pop with anyone else around us. This sounds by living the way you want. It sounds like it gives you more freedom. But yet does it? Do we look like we're a flourishing generation? Do we look like we are a nation who is doing well? Do we look peaceful? Do we look contented in our lives? Do we feel safe in our communities? I mean, the list of questions that I could ask this morning could go on and on and on. And I guarantee you most of the answers to them would be, well, no, we don't. God gave us those commandments because we were in such a mess that we needed help and we needed guidance that would give us an order and an authentic way of living life, a fair and a good, abundant life. And my lovely friend Jay John also goes on to say this, the laws do not restrict us, 
Rather, they free us to live in order and harmony. How good, how good. And Proverbs 15, verse 32 says this, an undisciplined, self-willed life is puny. An obedient, God-willed life is spacious. How good is that? You see, we are a generation that are disobedient and we're never satisfied. And by doing that, by being disobedient and living life how we want to and forgetting about what God has instructed us, we are robbing ourselves of that free, abundant life because we are disobedient and we have one, one big heart issue of coveting. You know, maybe we continue to covet because we are disobedient and we live the small life um, and the, the, the life that isn't free. Maybe we covet because we're not living in the plan that God has for us and we're not living that free, abundant life that he already has set out for us because we've taken our eyes off the Lord. We're still trying to walk in our own paths. James 4, anybody who knows me knows James' favorite book. Whoop, here we go. James 4 gives us insight into how coveting affects the unity. And I'm going to read it in the Amplified Version first, if that's okay, Nicola. What leads to the unending quarrels and conflicts among you? Do they not come from your hedonistic desires that wage war in your bodily members, fighting for control over you? You are jealous and covet what others have, and your lust goes unfulfilled. So you murder, you're envious and cannot obtain the object of your envy. So you fight and you battle. You do not have because you did not ask it of God. What a good verse, eh? I'm going to read it to you in the message in a minute, and it's even more fabulous. You see, by coveting, we are robbing ourselves of the free life and unity that God has promised us is achievable to have in our lives. In this passage, we see the effects that personal coveting has on the unity and the body of Christ. You see, coveting's a big deal. It's a big sin. It's a big heart issue. And God knew that we would struggle with it. So we put it in the commandments. Good, eh? And here's why it's a big deal. Number one, and we've already talked about this, when we covet, we're disobedient. Now I know none of us as children as God, as God's children, want to be disobedient, right? We don't just go out and go, well, I'm just going to be disobedient. It's not, it's just because our human flesh and our ridiculous selves sometimes we find it hard to be obedient I know we try our best to be obedient to God but being obedient takes self-awareness it takes self-awareness and not justifying our actions and our desires so that we just get what we want that's not maturity That's immaturity. It's spiritual immaturity. Being disobedient is a big problem because it disrespects God first and foremost. And the consequence for that, for us, is that it takes us out of the plan and the blessing that God has for us because we've taken our eyes off him. And we've decided to do things our own way. Dangerous. Number two is when we covet, it changes our decisions. History would show us that this is the truth. When we covet something that doesn't belong to us, it has to do, I'd love somebody to do scientific research on this because it has to do something to the brain. It has to. Because have you ever watched sensible, wise people make completely ridiculous, redonkulous decisions and they appear to lose all sense of reason and you think, what on earth has went on there? because they haven't thought about the consequence. Just like Eve, she plotted on because she wanted that knowledge and she wanted to know all things. That knowledge did not belong to her, but she ate it and she wanted because she wanted it. She did not think of the consequences that she had been warned of. And that is like us. When we start to covet things that do not belong to us and that were never for us, it starts to change our decisions. We don't think of others or how it might affect them or anything else. 
Come on, think about it. You all know that person, and maybe you're thinking even of yourself this morning, that seems does some random decision that seems completely out of character, and we can't understand it. Or maybe you've even found yourself somewhere six months, six, it's, you know, six years, whatever, down the line, and you think, how did I get here? I guarantee if you strike it back, it was probably because you coveted something that was not for you. The Bible is full of examples. King David, for example, let's take him. We see him chosen by God to be king. Now, this is a brief snapshot. He was chosen by God to be king. He was a man after God's own heart. However, we find him in a situation on the rooftop of a palace, and he sees a beautiful woman bathing, Bathsheba. He sees her. He wants her. He sends someone to find out about her. They come back and say, yeah, she's a married woman. And he says, well, I don't care. I want her. Go get her. Bring her here. He makes the decision that coveting has caused him to make to bring her, and he sleeps with her. He makes the decision that leads him in to the action. Number three, coveting leads to actions. We make decisions and then we act on them. We go to read on that David brought her, he slept with her, she got pregnant, and it goes from bad to worse. He then tries to hide the sin and brings Bathsheba's husband, who was actually in war, back from war to make it look like it was his child. But Bathsheba's um, husband was like, I don't, I'm not, I'm, that backfired on David because I'm not sleeping with my wife when all my men are out at war. So that plan backfired. So then it gets even worse where David then decides to have him murdered. What? What craziness has happened in this man's life? He has went boogaloo. What a crazy mess. And when you go from that place where he decides to have him murdered and he follows through on that action for him to be murdered and killed, when you strip all that back, it starts on the rooftop on that palace where he covets someone else's wife and it did not belong to him. It was never for him. Bathsheba was never meant for David. And here we see the consequences snowball because of coveting. You shall not covet comes from the last commandment. When you look at the list, it's the last one. And I often wonder if God placed it there on purpose. Do you know, as people, sometimes we don't have great attention spans, right? We listen a lot of the stuff at the start. We catch the end stuff, but somewhere in the middle, we kind of lose distraction. You see, the first couple of commandments we see is um, where God deals with our relationship with him. Very important, right? The next few in the middle are about how we treat others. And then the last one that we're looking at today is about coveting, is about our hearts and minds. And I often think, did God place that one at the end so that we'd remember it? Because from I can see it, and as I read through a lot of examples in the Bible and look at people around me in my own life, often the sin of coveting is the root cause of a lot of other sins and a lot of other reasons for disobedience. For example, the desire to be popular and to be like a friend who's really popular and on trend and has this amazing Instagram, you know, and everybody following her and they're actually making money out of this, blah, blah, blah. You end up starting making silly decisions yourself and you end up making yourself an idol on Instagram and posting everything about you, 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 so that you be like them. Hold on a minute, you've just broke a commandment. Another one? You've turned yourself into an idol. Now that's a whole other sermon which we might look at someday. But what about that promotion that you want in work? You go for it. Nothing necessarily wrong with that. Everybody's all right to desire a promotion, Amen. But you get into the interview and they start asking you questions and you go, well, maybe I'm underqualified for this. So you start telling a few white lies, maybe a few more. You sort of stretch the truth a bit to make yourself look even better. Oh, hold on. You've just broken another commandment. You shall not lie. Wanting the promotion isn't the sin, all right? But it's the motivation for it. It's the motivation in our hearts that motivate us to have and go for the promotion. What is your motivation? Is it because you need more money to feed your family? Well, that's a great motivation. That's a good one. That's, that's brilliant. Go for it. I hope God blesses you with it. But are you doing it because you've decided that you want to be um, more competitive? 
Is it because of, of, of your desire to be better than someone else? Is it to drive someone else out? Do you go for the promotion because you didn't want somebody else getting it because you don't want them to be your boss because you know they'll be terrible? What's the motivation behind the desire that you have in your heart? That's the root problem. Listen, we have desires. God gives us desires. He gives us things that we want. He gives us gifts, talents, all those things. It's not wrong to desire stuff. It's the motivation behind it that is the problem. You see, sometimes the promotion that you go for with the wrong motive isn't what God had for you, but you step into it and then it starts to affect your family life and you take on a promotion that's more responsibility, which means you spend more t- less time at home. Then that starts to affect your relationship or your health because you're not getting enough sleep at night or you're full of stress and worry. At what cost are we following desires with the wrong motivations into something that was never for us, like David? Bathsheba was never for David. David, it snowballed. Listen, I could go on and on and on and on with examples today about motivation and what we covet and desire. I often think if we take David, for example, without the first sin of coveting, someone else's wife, he wouldn't have made the decision to bring her to the palace and then act on that sin. He would have not have committed another sin and break another command of you shall not murder. And I wonder if we had a little bit more awareness of our motivation and our hearts for what we want or covet, would we make better decisions and would our actions be more obedient? Number four problem of coveting. And this one makes me a bit sad, actually. Maybe because it's one maybe personally I have struggled with over the years. It makes us ungrateful. Coveting makes you ungrateful. It changes your heart. As I've said this morning, it changes something in your heart. It changes something in your brain. It makes us ungrateful for what God has already given us. How disappointing. God is so good. He is so faithful. We are so blessed. And yet we continue to covet things, more of things. And it's not that we just then start to be ungrateful for the practical things in life, although we do struggle as a generation to get past these days, but then we start to become ungrateful in our relationships. And we start to look at other people and go, well, their relationship with their husband looks really good. I'd like mine to be like that. Well, maybe yours is just fine the way it is. Stop comparing, stop coveting somebody else's then we start to be ungrateful in our giftings that God has given us. Oh, do you know what? Like, you know, here I am up on the worship team, but you know what? Maybe I actually really want to do what Jim does. Maybe I want to lead the church. Maybe I'm not the person to lead the church. Maybe I'm meant to be the worship leader. Andrew Willis, if you know Andrew Willis, if you've been in the church, you'll know him. His friend from America has this quote, and I love it about gratefulness. He says this, and I wish I could do his accent and his way of doing it, but I can't, so I'm not even going to try. I'll just embarrass myself. <laughs> be grateful. Ungrateful people are toxic, not because they have less things, because they are less thankful. Thanks kills bitterness dead. Coveting makes us ungrateful. And I guess in my last few moments this morning, I want to ask us a question. The question we need to ask ourselves this morning is this, does what we covet align with God? And there's the question. Does what we covet, do what we want, our desires, does it align with God? As his people, as I said, we will have desires. We have wants, we have ambitions, we have gifts, talents, things that God has placed in us that are for us and he will strengthen us in. There is nothing wrong with that. We need those to keep us energized, to keep moving forward, to flourish. God's given us those. It's the motivation that we need to keep us pressing on in Jesus. But it's the motivation that we need to check. What is our motives? James 4, verse 3 in the message, and I told you I was going to read it, says this. You wouldn't think of just asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know you'd be asking for what you have no right to. Your spoiled children, each wanting your own way. You see, coveting often takes us away from what we truly desire. We start wanting things just because someone else has it. How ridiculous does that make us sound? 
It starts us asking for things that were never ours to have in the first place. Look at Eve, look at David. Knowledge was never Eve's to have. Bathsheba was never David's to have. And this morning the question is, what is our motivation this morning for the things that God has placed in our hearts? Is it because that's what God has for us? Or is it because we're wanting to be like someone else and have what someone else has? And this morning I want us to surrender our hearts to God and allow him to lead us in his will for our lives, for your life, rather than what he's given to someone else. And as the worship team come up, I want to just give you a little bit of encouragement because I feel like I've been a wee bit challenged this morning. But I want to give you encouragement when we look at, at, at David and we look at Eve. They messed up, right? Anyone else messed up? Anybody think they're going to continue to mess up? But the beauty of our God is that he's a loving God. And that even in their failures, listen to it, he didn't abandon them. He didn't abandon them. There was consequences for their actions. And they were big ones. And I don't have time to go into them this morning. You, that's your homework. You can go home and listen, look at their consequences of Eve's actions and David's. There was big ones. But we serve a God that is always, always about redemption. And he's always about forgiveness. He gave us Jesus. So our wrongdoings, our past, our present and our future ones, when we've accepted Jesus, Jesus has made them right for us. He has cleansed us from those sins. So this morning, I don't want anybody walking out of here this morning feeling condemned because we've talked about our covenant and hearts. But I want you challenged just to look at your motivations and your heart. But I want you to be encouraged and to know that we have a God that is always, always about loving you, about championing you for his glory and for his kingdom. And when we stay in line with him and we align our hearts and we're obedient to what he has called us to be and how he's called us to live. He blesses us. So this morning, I want you to feel encouraged that you're free this morning. We've sang about it this morning. You are free in Jesus this morning. You are not held by the chains of sin, amen? Amen. And just as we come into worship, I wanna just give you four things that you can do to get a handle on the covet and heart if you face it. I'm gonna do a little study on this somewhere, maybe on Tuesday night somewhere along the line, but here's just four things. One, be aware and evaluate your motives for wanting X, Y, and Z. Two, create a heart of gratitude. It's the first thing, when you start thanking the Lord for what you already have, you look less about what other people have around you. Three, be generous to others. Thinking of others gets yourself, your head out of your me, myself, and I headspace. And number four, which is a big one, which we definitely will look at in the future, is focus on your relationships, not belongings. Focus on your relationship with the Lord. Focus on your relationship with your loved ones. Those four things will help you deal with covering. It's a hard issue. It's a hard issue. But it's one that our God help us with, will guide us with. And when we mess it up, He forgives us. Amen.